Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the delta function potential. It's, uh, it's necessary first to talk about what the heck a delta function is. So it's hard to uh, write down a, an algebraic expression for a delta function because there, there really isn't such a thing exactly. But uh, there are a couple of limiting cases that I think give us some insight into what a delta function could be. So you could think of it as the limit, as a approaches zero, of this function. This is called a Lorentzian. And I've made a graph here of several different Lorentzians with different values of a. Notice that when a is 0.3, it, uh, it's sort of a short, wide thing. But as a gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the Lorentzian gets skinnier and taller. But the, uh, the coefficient in front is cooked up so that the area under the Lorentzian is always the same. It's always 1. So a delta function is, uh, roughly speaking, a skinny, tall thing uh, that has an area equal to 1. In the limit that a goes to 0, it becomes infinitely skinny, infinitely tall, but it retains its finite area. As another example, um, you could think of it as a limiting case of a Gaussian. Again, it's a Gaussian whose width and height are going to change. With, when A is large, it's sort of short and wide. As A gets smaller and smaller, it gets taller and skinnier. But again, throughout this variation of A, the area remains fixed. So if you compute the area under this Gaussian, you always get 1. So again, a delta function is a very tall, very skinny function that uh, it's infinitely high, infinitely skinny, and uh, has an area, again, equal to 1. So the more mathematical definition is this integral, but uh, this integral is pretty hard to visualize. When, when k <coughs> goes from minus infinity to infinity, the exponential just uh, rotates in phase. It's just a phasor that spins around the um, the axis, I guess, you could think of it that way, and uh, for different values of k it spins different amounts, but uh, when you add them all up you get nothing, kind of. I mean, uh, the idea is that when you go through one complete cycle you get nothing, and if you go th through an infinite number of complete cycles by integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity, you still get nothing. So that's kind of one way to think about it. Of course, when k is equal to 0, uh, you get e to the 0, which is 1. So you're integrating 1 from minus infinity to infinity. And so, of course, you get infinity. So the function is infinite when x is equal to 0. It's 0 when x is non-zero. And it's a matter of some uh, mathematics to show that uh, when you integrate over all x, you get uh, you get one. So, and that is probably the most important behavior of this delta function, is that if you go from one side, if you have a delta of x minus a, it's a delta function centered at x equals a, and you integrate from one side of the delta function to the other side, in other words, from a minus epsilon to a plus epsilon, where epsilon is greater than zero, it's not it's not equal to zero. So you're going a finite distance to the left of a and a finite distance to the right of a, then what you get is the function evaluated exactly at a. That makes sense because uh, since the delta function is non-zero only when x is equal to a, the function doesn't vary when x is equal to a, it's just equal to f of a, so the function comes out of the integral and you get the integral of the delta function, which of course is just 1, times the function evaluated at a. So that's the idea of a delta function. Let's talk about a delta potential. If I have a delta potential, it basically is a potential energy function, which is proportional to a delta function. Now one thing to notice is that uh, because the integral of the delta function over x is equal to 1, that means the delta function itself has units of 1 over distance. So since alpha times the delta function has to have units of energy, it means alpha has to have units of energy divided by distance, or it must have units of force, essentially. Okay, 
It turns out that uh, a delta function admits only a single bound state. Let's see how that comes about. What we can do is write out the Schrodinger equation, put the delta function in there, and, uh, and see what kind of solutions we get. If we plug in everything, it ends up looking something like this. If we uh, multiply through by 2m over h bar squared with a minus sign, um, we get this differential equation. And the question is how to solve it. We'll solve it in two steps. First, we'll look for bound states where the energy is less than 0. And we will um, consider those portions of the x-axis that are away from the origin. So if we neglect the origin at the moment, then the delta function is 0. And the thing simplifies to uh, just the second derivative of psi is minus a constant times psi. We're going to call the constant kappa squared. You can see that for that to work, kappa has to be the square root of 2me over h-bar, or two absolute value 2me over h-bar, since e is negative. e is going to be less than 0, since we're looking for bound states. And, uh, and psi, of course, has to therefore be a superposition of two types of solutions, um, an e to the plus kappa x and an e to the minus kappa x. Now, the thing is, if you're left of the origin, then the term e to the minus kappa x is going to lead to trouble because it'll blow up as x goes to minus infinity. If you're to the right of the origin, e to the plus kappa x is going to blow up. So what has to happen is the wave function has to be e to the plus kappa x when x is less than 0. It's got to go like e to the minus kappa x when x is greater than 0. And it also has to uh, be continuous which means that at the origin, the left and the right solutions have to match, which they do as long as the coefficient, a, is the same on both sides. So if you look at the solution, it ends up looking something like this. Now, what do we do about the origin? Okay, to handle the origin, we go back to the Schrodinger equation, and it turns out all delta function problems, all delta function potentials, uh, get handled the same way. Well, you can't deal with the delta function directly you have to integrate across the delta function so that the properties we have for the delta function can be invoked. So if we integrate both sides of the Schrodinger equation from a, a little bit to the left to a little bit to the right of the origin, so we'll go from minus epsilon to plus epsilon, notice that uh, the second derivative integrated gives you the first derivative. The delta function integrated just gives you the wave function evaluated at the origin. And the wave function integrated over a tiny distance uh, gives you nothing, because the, we're going to let epsilon go to 0 in the end, or become nearly 0. So um, looking at th what happens, we get uh, the first derivative evaluated at plus or minus epsilon, plus 2m alpha over h bar squared times the value of the wave function at the origin, which is what we get from the delta function integrated, uh, is equal to 0. So if you look at that, what that tells us is the slope has a kink in it. And the kink happens between plus and minus epsilon. And uh, putting in our solutions just to the right and just to the left of the origin, the e to the minus kappa x and e to the plus kappa x, what we get is that um, minus 2 kappa a is minus 2m alpha over h bar squared times a. And so the 2s cancel and the a's cancel. And what you get is a condition on kappa. Now remember that kappa was related to the energy. So if we know kappa, we know the energy. So now we know the energy of the bound state. So that's how that works. I wanted to point out you can also use dimensional analysis to, ar to arrive at the same result. Um, you know that the kappa has to have some kind of units. It, it needs to be some, um, well, it has units of 1 over length. But it's got to be built up somehow of mass of alpha and h-bar, because those are the only constants in the equation. And so we can plug in uh, 1 over kappa has to be m to the a, and then it's got to be alpha to the b, and it's got to be h-bar to the c. If we put in what the units of m, alpha, and h-bar are, the only way we can get it to work out is if uh, a plus b plus c is 0. If uh, negative 1, that's the 1 over L, is 3b plus 2c, you can see how things have to add up. And we know that um, negative 2b minus c has to be 0, since there's no time 
in one over length. And then we get three equations and three unknowns, and we can solve them. So we get b is equal to 1, c is equal to negative 2, a is equal to 1. And that tells us that unit-wise, at least, kappa has to be proportional to m alpha over h bar squared. It turns out it's not just proportional to, it's actually equal to. So the proportionality constant happens to be 1. But uh, I just wanted to point out that dimensional analysis is a very powerful technique for uh, for estimating the behavior of solutions to differential equations, or at least to eigenvalues. Okay.